Hello everyone, welcome to Royals at the Ranch, episode number three. This is the series where we explore the behavior, temperament, and trainability of Python Regis, or Royal Pythons. Yes, we're on an actual ranch, so oftentimes you might hear or see other animals in the background because we are located at Spirit Keeper Equine Sanctuary and we have horses, dogs, cats, snakes, pigs, and until recently, chickens, but we lost our last chicken not too long ago. We are a nonprofit 501c3 animal sanctuary and it is home to Behavior Education LLC. At Behavior Education, we're doing several behavior studies involving snakes, and those include not only behavior observation studies, but also training trials. And we're doing those with the Royal Pythons as well. So if you haven't watched episodes one and two, you might wanna go back and catch those because each episode in this series, which is specifically about Royal Pythons, is going to progress into the next and we're gonna tell a story about how Royal Pythons came to be here and the behavior studies that I'm doing with them as well as how the training trials are going and some information about each of the individual animals here. Welcome to episode three of Royals at the Ranch. As I stated at the end of episode two, we're going to start this episode by talking about what preference testing is and how it works. And then I'm going to discuss how I went about planning the project. And that project is the initial behavior study that I implemented here with Royal Pythons. Then I will get into how I started choosing the animals. And then we will pick up with that topic in episode four. This preference testing is used in scientific research, both in the human world and in the animal world, in psychology and behavior science, as well as in welfare science. When an animal is given a choice between two resources concurrently or at the same time, and that animal realizes that they actually have control over accessing either resource, and they've had enough time to acclimate to both resources and feel comfortable with both, Preference testing is used as a method of assessing what is the most important thing to the animal by observing their behavior objectively and recording it. I wanna read you this quote by Carl Safina. It's from a TED Talk he did in 2016, and I'll of course put the link to that TED Talk in the video description. We can see brains but cannot see minds, yet we can see the workings of minds in the logic of behaviors. And that leads us into the questions that research is using preference testing to try and answer. Preference testing addresses these following research questions. Is the animal motivated to obtain or avoid a specific resource? Does the animal indicate a preference among two or more alternative resources? How strong is the animal's motivation or preference? And is the strength of the motivation or the strength of the preference altered by changes to the animal's internal or external environment? And when we do choice preference testing, which is the study that I implemented with two royal pythons, it's really important to understand this last question because the animal's internal environment are things like where they're at in their ecdesis cycle, their reproductive cycle, are they sick, ill, or injured? How are they feeling internally? Because those things are gonna affect the choices they make and where they wanna spend their time and how they wanna spend their time. And then the external environment certainly, certainly makes a difference as to the choices we make and all animals make. And the external environment is literally everything around us all the time. So to put snakes in a situation where we're asking them to choose between which habitat style they prefer we need to make sure that we're giving them enough time to acclimate to both habitat styles, realize that they have control over which one they spend time in. And then we need to watch them for a long enough period that they're comfortable with both environments. Things like individual temperament can make a difference. If an animal is neophobic, which means that they're afraid of novelty or they tend to be afraid of new items, it might take them a very long time to feel comfortable enough to investigate something that's new. We have to make sure that we keep all of this in mind before we start recording behaviors in regards to what the animals are choosing. 
Because it was mentioned in the previous slide as part of our definition, I want to go over what motivation is. And science defines motivation as the process within the brain which controls behaviors and physiological changes that are occurring and when those occur. It's also a construct used to describe the strength or willingness with which an animal engages in a behavior. Now, we now know the neurochemical that is highly correlated with motivation is dopamine. That if an organism is deprived of dopamine, if their dopamine production stops or is diminished, that they no longer have the motivation to earn rewards or to earn reinforcement or to work for things. I may still prefer getting a paycheck over not getting a paycheck, but I'm no longer gonna be motivated to work for that paycheck if I don't have dopamine being produced in my brain. So a snake still may prefer rats over mice, but they aren't going to be motivated to work in order to obtain a rat or a mouse if dopamine production has been inhibited or diminished within their brain. There have been studies that were specifically on the brains of Python Regis showing that dopamine is produced and is present in their brains, and I will link those in the video description. Preference is a difference between the strength of motivation to obtain or avoid one resource or stimulus, and it's the strength of motivation to obtain or avoid another. It's just the difference between motivations for alternatives that are available. It's time for a behavior break. And in tonight's episode, we're gonna talk about a very common behavior that we see in Python Regis. And that is when they coil the first third of their body or at least their head and neck into an S shape. And it's a form of alert behavior or defensive posture that they do when they perceive a possible threat. When a snake gets in a neck posture that is in the shape of an S or maybe in the shape of an M or a W because it has several little serpentine segments in it, it's a defensive posture that they get into so that they're able to make a threat assessment and be ready to act if necessary. So the snake may be within their enclosure, they may be out interacting with you, or they may be out just exploring, and something has stimulated them to perceive a potential or possible threat. It could be something that suddenly startles them, like a surprising event, or the appearance of something new in the environment that they weren't expecting, or maybe they encountered something as they were moving around exploring that they didn't expect and that they hadn't seen before. So they're unsure if the change in conditions or circumstances or if this new object is dangerous or not. So drawing their head in closer to their body does a couple of things. It distances them from the potential threat and this gives them more time to assess and evaluate the situation or the novel object and decide whether it's safe to proceed forward, if they should retreat or how they should react to this change. The S shape places their body in an ideal position for them to be mobile in one of several different directions. It gives them lots and lots of options. So coiling back this way, they're able to easily retract further and freeze into their ball and hide their head if they feel that they need to do that to protect themselves. They're able to easily turn and flee quickly if they need to or advance and fight quickly if they need to or they could simply assess the situation, decide that something's not a threat, relax and continue as they did before. Choice tests are one of the types of preference tests that is common in scientific research. And this is where the animal has an opportunity to make choices between alternative environments or resources. And this is the type of test that I chose to do with the two initial Python Regis study subjects that I added here at Behavior Education. I just wanted to know, given the opportunity to access a tub versus an enriched habitat, where would they choose to spend most of their time? So the resource that the animal chooses more often or consumes in greater quantity or spends more time with is said to be the preferred resource. So all I had planned to do was watch the snakes and interfere with them as little as possible and not do anything to influence their behavior. Just set them up in a situation like the one you see in this picture where they have a completely furnished 
tub that they would have lived in in a rack system and just cut a hole in it and give them access to a more environmentally complex habitat if they chose. These are the options that I gave my two initial study animals. One option was a tub containing a water dish, plain paper substrate, and a hide, and then heated with a heat mat. When I obtained these two animals, they were both living in a rack system where they lived on plain paper and had a water dish, and I was told by both breeders that hides were optional. I did end up giving them a water dish, plain paper substrate, and a hide. The other option that the snakes had available to them was a PVC enclosure containing a large water tub, big enough to put their whole body in. They had aspen in part of the enclosure and cypress mulch in the part of the enclosure around where the water dish was. They had a humidity box or a humid hide that was filled with damp New Zealand sphagnum moss, a climbing branch, a ledge, a PVC perch, a half coconut hide, and a black plastic hide. And then this PVC enclosure was heated with a halogen bulb and UVB lamp from above. And then they had optional access to a heat mat below at nighttime. A paradigm is a distinct set of concepts or thought processes that are just a typical example or a typical model of something. It's what has always been the norm and thought to be the norm, but paradigms can change. So I called it Project Paradigm. The subjects were Aminette and Amun, and they are pictured here. I got them from two different breeders. They're around the same age. Here is the question that I meant to try and answer from this behavior study by just setting the animals up with these choices, these opportunities to choose between two living conditions, and then me stepping back and being hands off as much as possible and interfering with them as little as possible and not trying to influence any decisions they were making. The question is, given the choice and control over habitat type, will their preference be to spend time in a tub or bin such as they would exist in an Iraq system or to spend time in a 36 inch wide by 23 inch deep by 21 inch high enclosure with a pseudo naturalistic habitat? So step one was to choose the animals. Step two would be to set up their quarantine tubs as close to identical as possible to how they were living at their breeders prior to arriving. Step three is to obtain PVC enclosures and set them up with pseudo naturalistic habitats. Step four would be to obtain the animals, place them into the quarantine tubs. That actually happened on March 24th of 2020. But then step five was gonna to be to place the quarantine tub inside a completely furnished pseudo naturalistic habitat enclosure as listed above. Create an opening in the tub or bin large enough for the snake to get in and out of. And then that would provide them the opportunity to choose time inside the tub or bin or time outside the tub or bin. If they never wanted to leave their tub, it was gonna have water in it and paper substrate in it and a hide. They could choose to live in there their whole life and never leave it. And they would have everything that they needed to survive. I would feed them in there if they didn't come out of it. Or they had the choice to come out of the tub and explore, use, or live in the pseudo naturalistic habitat enclosure, which would have different kinds of natural substrates, branches, PVC perches, ledges, shelves, um, a large water dish, a humid hide, and then two other hides, a coconut hide and a pl black plastic hide. Step six would be to monitor the snake's activities with real-time observations and or via surveillance video, and then maintain a log of behaviors and activities. And I watched these animals for over a year. Thanks for sticking with me and enjoy the rest of the episode. enjoyed that as much as I did. I really like the Royals in your home segment and I want to encourage you to send me short video clips or photographs of Python Regis in your homes that I can share in future episodes. 
Now I am here with Aminette, one of the two original study animals that I chose for the habitat study. We now have a few more royal pythons and you're gonna to get to meet them as the series progresses. I promised you I would let you know how I chose the animals for the original study. And I already alluded to the fact that it was much more difficult than I thought it would be. And that's because in early 2020, I had no idea where to start looking. I didn't know any Python Regis breeders personally. I was very familiar with people in the Morelia community, but not in the Royal Python community. And so I ended up going on Morph Market and I followed some very, very methodical procedures that I came up with to find two animals on Morph Market out of the thousands of Royal Pythons that were listed there. And I narrowed it down to Amun and Aminette. This is Aminette. This is actually the first time that she's ever been in a video live with me holding her. As I said before, I set Amun and Aminette up in this tub versus habitat situation where they had access to both and they could choose between them. And I basically was very hands off with them for over a year, for the first year that they were here. So I wasn't doing any handling, any habituation, other than of course I was feeding them. So they aren't as used to me as some of the other snakes. And that was by design. I did not want to influence their preferences in any way. So I tried to leave them alone as much as possible and simply make my observations about what choices they were making in regard to where they wanted to spend their time. Now, I know that I've gone through a lot of preliminary and background information in these first three episodes. So starting next week, we are definitely gonna get into more animal stuff because I am gonna walk you through the process that I went through to choose a moon and aminette off of Morph Market. I'm gonna show you exactly what my thinking was, my process of elimination from the thousands of royal pythons that were on there, and you're gonna to get to see more of the animals. Now, notice that behavior that she just did while I was talking was exactly the behavior that I went over in tonight's behavior break. And it's something that royal pythons and many other species of snakes do quite often. When they encounter something unfamiliar or when they are suddenly startled, they will coil their neck back into that S shape and it just gives them tons of options as to how to proceed from there. I want to thank everyone for watching this week. Please join me again next week for another episode of Royals at the Ranch. And until then, everybody, please remember to always be kind and love your animals.